Hey, Phil. Hey, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay, I will let you share. I'm just putting this up in case anybody was coming, so let me stop sharing. Let's make sure you can share okay. Oh, would you would you like me to try it? Yes. Yeah, let's go ahead and give that a try. I found out the chances of something go wrong the closer you get to the time period. So if you give yourself a good five, ten minutes, fewer things go wrong. That's just how yeah. it works. Okay. How's that look? <laughs> yeah, that looks great. Okay. I would share more, but I want to make sure people see like my $20 million podcast studio behind me. Yeah, that's uh, that's impressive. I, I yeah, like that. yeah. Yeah, it has a fake plant and, and everything. So I yeah. use being on video as an excuse to buy old books, you know, to put behind me. Oh, I nice. Probably could have just gone with a backdrop, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think I've got everything set up, so I can kick this off to send to Facebook and uh, YouTube. That's mostly oh, nice. a test, um, mainly because if you're talking, I can troubleshoot stuff that normally I can't do when I'm the one talking. Oh, <laughs> so. okay. Glad I could help. Is that what this was all about? You're like, you're like, I'm gonna try to broadcast this on some different venues, so I need a speaker who I don't care. If they <laughs> I'm across like what's the lowest <laughs> collateral damage no I no act not having this go well I know <laughs> the ledger would it, it was a little the other way around of I know Phil can run this well oh, I'll go ahead and experiment with this while so uh, the opposite of what you were thinking but I see that was an excellent save <laughs> And um, I've, I got the uh, questions together uh, so we can put those at the end, um, including a, um, a question about what is the name of your podcast to make sure people can remember it well. Like so we'll. Uh, I like that. It's a good idea. Yeah, that reminds me of myself one more thing. I just realized I need to add the Q&A to that slide. Okay, so I was thinking when we get to that point, we'll go through and um, maybe do your do the the quiz question things first, um, and then uh, look at all the Q and A, uh, just in case we end up because as we talk through it, maybe we'll answer some questions. Um, okay, as we go through your stuff. Okay, yeah, and and feel free to make loud noises and things like that if something <laughs> is uh, something is really on fire in the Q and A. I'm happy to stop, but someone has to stop me. So, okay. Um, matter of fact, let me. Let's see Let's see if this works. You know, this. It seems like this is the time when we need to have like music playing. Uh, you know? Sometimes I do that with like a oh. countdown clock and stuff. Um, oh wow. It, it's it's really impressive when it works, but it only has about a one out of five chances of me actually not messing something up in it. So, uh, nice. okay. <laughs> uh.
So I decided, I actually decided not to subject you to that. Um, okay. I appreciate that. Although, uh, flaming numbers counting down from, you know, 720 or wherever <laughs> people like to start those clocks is, is an entertaining way to start these kinds of things. Um, I, you know, a uh, long, long time ago, uh, when I was going to work for a local company here in their orientation, they signaled the beginning and end of all break times by playing um, Starship's song, We Built This City on Rock and Roll. Um, so now, <laughs> unfortunately, I sort of have a little bit of a trauma response to that song <laughs> now, um, which is unfortunate. Because, I, I like that song. I actually yeah, I like that too. song. So I do too. <laughs> and it, is like, it was like uh, America's national anthem when I was a kid. Um, but, uh, but now I always like, now whenever I hear that song, I always associate it with like a presentation about to start. <laughs> I, I have a similar thing of um, who did the final countdown song? Europe. Yeah. So we, I was working on a big project. We've been working on this over like three or four years and we were getting ready to kick off the, the, um, the migration that was going to take like over a weekend and stuff. We're all ready. And so one of the other coaches like starts playing that, you know, final countdown stuff like, oh, well, it's not ready. So he stops it, you know, and 15 minutes later, like, okay, we're ready. He started like five or six times before we finally were ready to kick it off. It was great. It was like the third to final countdown. Right, right. Some of Europe's deeper cuts. Yeah. But but he was right there to kick it off every every single time. He, he um, wanted that bit to work. Yes, yes. We were going to really get the committed. timing right, even if it ruined the effect. Yeah. <laughs> is committed to that bit. I can respect that. Hey, um, everybody on the on the call, I just threw a link in the chat for the thing that you can ask questions as we go. It's also got a link to Phil's uh, podcast that you might want to click on and, and subscribe to if you are a podcasting person. Um, but if somebody can go in and just throw a question in the Q&A and just so I can see if it works correctly. Just ask a question and then I'll clear it out. think you should be able to vote each other's questions up and down. I'm a Scorpio, if that's what people are asking. I, I assume. I just <laughs> you assume kind of... that's what they're asking about? Yeah. Okay, how's your day? Great, it works. Thank you, whoever put in there. They didn't it's want to know if you were Scorpio. Well. They just wondered if how's your day going. So, so Phil, well, how thanks. is your day going? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, it's kind of a kind of a slower, quieter Tuesday. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, things been going pretty well. Okay. And the next question was: Is it still time for a happy new year? And then somebody wanted to know if it's Friday already, which, um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've, I've got some bad news for that person, um, <laughs> but I, I definitely appreciate the sentiment. Okay, well, it looks like that's working, so perfect. Okay, and that also means the chat is working, so that is a good thing. means I should take this opportunity and make sure that everybody has. I've got one person has joined the room for next week's meeting. They must be really excited about that topic. <laughs> as long as they don't leave, then that would just make me feel bad, right? <laughs> What's uh, next week's topic? Uh, BDD. We're going to look at behavior-driven development. Oh, that's a good topic. And And horrible wasps that sting things and how we can represent their behavior as a BDD scenarios. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the wasp angle is new to me, but uh, BDD is a, is a fine topic. <laughs> I, I try to make stuff memorable. So, <laughs> you know, the, the I wasp. Mean, you remember wasps. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. They, they sting crickets. 
and immobilize them and then bury them in the ground with their larva so they're stunned but still alive so their larva can eat them alive. Anyway, we represent the whole way of how they do stuff as behavior-driven development. Wasps are just the jerks of the animal kingdom. You know, <laughs> they're, they're just awful. Yeah. Uh, and and if th this talk will make you think even even more of that, but they, uh, yeah, they're... <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> I, I have had a few people tell me that they were traumatized by that still, but they did oh, remember the point, so that's a... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, Mark. You know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes you have to leave these indelible marks on people to make sure that they understand how BDD works. Yes, that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay, cool. That is going live now, so that's great. Oh, we've actually got quite a few people. More people on the stream on those other streams that I was talking about. So evidently some people are joining that. It's cool. Okay, good. Okay, well, we are almost at the top of the hour, and it looks like people are probably frantically running to their fridge and getting something to eat or drink to sit down to hear what Phil has to say. Ooh. Um so in introducing uh Phil is a co-owner of Inspired Solutions in, in Kansas City. And I've run into Phil several times at uh different conferences and stuff and always enjoyed what he had to say and he was gracious enough to agree to uh, come talk to us about retrospectives. So I am in the audience today as well and looking forward to learning everything I can about uh, retrospectives. Let me throw a few uh, links out here. Phil's podcast, and I'll give you this link a few times, but I want to make sure you guys have it because his stuff's really good. Uh, can be found right here and that it's Anchor FM, so I think that'll let you choose from different places. You can also search for Agile Bytes. It's the name of the podcast. If you search for Agile Bytes, it will come up at, at the top. So if you just remember that, that, that will help you. Or click on the link and sign up for it right now. Um, so, and remember Agile Bytes. That might become important here just a little bit later on. I'm also going to throw a link out here for the, oh, you know, that's the one thing I forgot to do. Let me mute everybody. Um, and Phil, you might have to unmute after I do this, but uh, so just watch for that. So okay. I will mute everybody here. Some people might consider that to be a big improvement. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just kind of play that choice by ear. Okay, I can still hear you, so I think think we're good. Um, okay, so there's the Minty Meter um, thing. If you have Q&A as you go, type it into the, the Minty Meter. Um, we're going to go through everything. We've got some questions from what Phil's going to talk about, and then we'll go through any time we have to look at whatever you vote up or down on the, the Q&A stuff. Um, so with that, Phil, great to have you here, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm very honored and flattered to be invited to be doing the Lunch and Learn today. Uh, Mark, for those of you who are not local, Mark is a very, very well-respected Agile professional in the community and, uh, and colleague and friend. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm very happy to be doing the presentation today. All right, so uh, with that said, I am going to share my screen and blow your minds with an audio-visual feast that is Google Slides. Um, I am actually using a template that I had to actually scroll down for. So, I mean, this is, this is pretty intense stuff. Uh, I had to work hard to get this layout. So, I, I mean, at least I didn't pick like the first one, right? I think the first one is like simple, simple white or something like that, so. Um, so I want to talk about retrospectives at work. I will have a slide at the end that has like my contact information and a little bit more about me, but that is tremendously boring. Uh, like Mark said, I am one of the owners of Integrity Inspired Solutions. We are a custom software development company uh, here in Kansas City. Uh, so if you have any software development projects that you need to get done, give me a call. Uh, I, as an individual, however, focus a lot on agile mentoring, agile coaching, uh, lean stuff, especially in the software development space. Uh, so I'm usually out and about amongst your companies, uh, having talks with your teams and project managers and things like that. But today I want to talk a little bit about retrospectives. Uh, a lot of people have retrospectives. Obviously, it is an actual part of Scrum if you are Scrum folks. But even outside of Scrum, like a lot of my teams do not do Scrum, we still use retrospectives. Uh, they're still a, a, a great tool 
And so I wanted to talk about them. And I have a, uh, a slide that I want to get out of the way right off the bat. Um, this is probably the most important thing that I have to get across today. And so I want to put this out here because if people want to bail in the first five minutes or, you know, we end up pressed for time. I wanted to have said this. This is just true no matter what you're doing with your teams. And that is you want to structure the event around the goal of the event. Otherwise, the structure that you're using will set the goal for you. And what you want to do is start with what you're trying to get out of the event and then work your way backwards as you think about how you want to conduct that event as opposed to the other way around. You know, um, a lot of us, you know, uh, when we become like newbie scrum masters or, or agile folks or whatever, uh, we do a daily stand up. And so we want to know how to do a daily stand up. And, you know, if you're like me and you learned scrum back in 1776, um, they usually say, okay, well, what you do with your daily standup is you go around the circle and you ask everybody, I mean, you can you probably say this with me, right? What did you do yesterday? What do you plan to do today? Uh, and do you have any blockers? So you're like, oh, that's how you do a daily standup. Sweet. That's easy. I'll do that. And so you start doing that. And then in a couple of months, you're like, why do all my daily standups sound like status meetings? Well, because you are literally asking everyone to give a status report. That's why it sounds like a status report, right? Your, your structure took you to a goal, right? And what you want to do is think of the goal first and then pick the structure that best gets you to that goal. So if the goal of your daily standup is to inspect progress against the sprint goal or to for the team to come up with their plan of attack for the work that day or whatever, then you want to pick the structure and questions that get you to that goal. Um, you don't want to pick a structure and then see what happens, right? Because it's not about the structure, it's about the goal, it's about the value. So I want to have said that. I'm going to return to this point several different times as we talk about retrospectives. It is solely why um, I ended up where I've ended up when it comes to retrospectives. So why are we talking about this at all? Well, a lot of times when I talk with Agile teams, there's some common stuff that I hear them mention when we talk about retrospectives. One is we don't do retrospectives, right? Or, or we do, but under times of high pressure, they're the first thing to get cut, right? Um, uh, I, I see this happen with a lot of teams. It's like we get close to a deadline, the pressure's on, and we quit having retrospectives so we can use that time for other things, which is always intriguing if you think about it. Like, uh, like what's a better time to think about the way you're working and improve it than when you are suffering from pressure, right? When you're suffering from uh, efficiency problems. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll tell my clients, it's like, uh, we're all so busy putting out the fire that no one has time to shut the gas line down, you know? And, and uh, that, that is very true with retrospectives, I find. Um, the second one, we leave having had a good discussion, but there's no actions at the end. So we all got a lot off our chest, right? Maybe we feel better. Maybe we feel worse. Sometimes venting just makes everybody feel worse. Um, but, uh, but we didn't have any actions at the end. There was nothing for us to do. We talked and talked and talked, and then we just kind of quit, right? We, we hit our time box <laughs> for the meeting, right? Um, Another problem that some people have is we leave, it's the exact opposite. We leave having 8 million actions to take, right? Uh, you don't, nobody has to raise their hand. Nobody has to make eye contact or verbally acknowledge this, but do you have an improvement backlog? Okay, so yes, what, what is the one tool we use to manage too much work that we're never gonna get around to? It's a backlog, right? And so this sometimes happens on the back end of retrospectives as well. We end up with tons and tons of actions to take. Uh, we may never get around to getting all this stuff done. This fourth one is one that I really want to uh, help out with, and that is attendance is sporadic or non-existent. Um, I have trouble getting people to come consistently to the retrospectives um or they just don't come at all people are just not excited they're they're bored they they're doing other things they don't prioritize the retrospective so i end up with only like a few people or or nobody at all with the retrospectives i really want to touch on that today and then finally this is very closely related is people think they're a waste of time compared to the other things that they need to be doing right we're all busy we've all got stuff going on 
why do I want to stop these important things that I'm doing to go do a retrospective? So these are things that I hear from Agile teams, and this is why I think it's important to talk about retrospectives and how to create retrospectives that actually work, that people actually want to go to. That's what this is all about. So I want to talk sort of about retrospectives that have gone by. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit transparent with all of you, uh, kind of about my own experiences, because when I started doing retrospectives, I was not very good at facilitating them. Uh, I didn't really know what the goal was supposed to be. I just had learned from the, the dude who did my Scrum Master certification training what you were supposed to do, right? I, I, what a retrospective was supposed to look like. But I didn't really understand it. And so um, the way I was taught uh, when I was a, a, a baby Agile coach, um, meaning I, I was early in my Agile coaching career, not that I coached uh, babies. But the, the way I was taught is you go around the room and each person says what went well, what didn't go well, uh, and what we should do differently next time, right? And so either like you go around the room and you do one question at a time, or you go around the room and everybody does all three of these questions. But this is ultimately what you do. It's almost like um, like the the dark evil version of the daily stand-ups three questions right uh instead of instead of what did you do yesterday what are you going to do today then we go around and we ask these three questions instead uh there are also alternate universe versions of this that i've heard uh what should we stop doing what should we start doing what are things that we should change this is also a, a popular version of the go around the room have the three questions one that i heard uh from a, a team we worked with at one client uh what are the things that made you mad or sad or glad or, or plaid or bad or chad or yeah i know they all rhymed right mad sad glad that was another thing that um that these are all basically versions of the same thing is you go around the room and each person sort of tells you what things they like what things they don't like and what they wish would be different and probably a lot of you have done retrospectives like that i certainly have as well but here's the thing this structure takes us to certain goals. They, it had, this structure has certain characteristics to it. One issue, I'm going to call it an issue. Uh, it's an issue for me. It may not be an issue for you. And, and this, is, this is an important point. I have certain goals for retrospectives. And so I pick structures that fit my goals. You may look at retrospectives very differently than I do, and that is fine. And if you do, then you may pick different things because some of the things that I think are problems, you may, you may think are assets, actually, and vice versa. And that's fine, okay? It's, it's all about what fits your context and works for your teams. You can't take what I do, drop it right on top of your teams and expect magic to happen, right? Everyone's context is different. But hopefully the principles to help you think about your retrospectives are going to be applicable in your context, even if you don't see retrospectives in exactly the same way I do. Here's the problem that I have with the go around the room and answer three questions approach. One is, is that it's very individualistic. I'm getting six, eight, 10, 12, 13 individuals views on what the issues are and what we should do about them. Okay, it's, it's very individual focused. We're not attacking it as a team. We're attacking it as a group of individuals who are sitting in the same room, right? And, and going around and sort of shining the spotlight on each individual. Yeah, I'm getting their individual takes, but we're not a attacking this project as a team, just like I would want them to do everything else, right? Um, the second thing is that this often generates a lot of items, okay? When you go around and you ask eight people, like, what things should we start doing, what things should we stop doing, and what things should we change, um, even if just each person has only one thing, that's eight things, right, by the end of the retrospective, which is a lot. And a lot of times people generate a lot more than that, right? And so you end up with 12, 16, 32 things, all from a single retrospective. This last point, and please forgive me, but this happens, is that a lot of times these sessions can devolve into what I call unfocused winery, um, where now people are just saying stuff they don't like. And, and this just kind of goes on and on and on and on, 
right? Um, and, and maybe there's some therapeutic value to that, uh, but a lot of times um, it just, it's just, we all just kind of start feeling bad and, and, and it's got no direction to it. Um, and, and it gets even worse when people start naming names, right? Like I had this one retrospective and these two developers and one of them goes, I'm not gonna use their real names, but one of them goes, yeah, Scott over there did a check-in that totally overwrote my code that I had worked on all day. And this was funny to me because uh, this person and Scott shared a cubicle. Like they, they literally sat next to each other. Um, so for my contribution to the retrospective, I suggested a fix um, that would be like turning 90 degrees to look at Scott and see what Scott was working on. Um, so um, that, that's, that's what these sessions can kind of turn into. Uh, and I didn't like that. It's very hard to make improvements when you have several different versions of reality, many suggestions on what to change, or no suggestions on what to change. A very, very smart person said this just now. Um, and and, and this, is, this is why the goal of the retrospective needs to dictate your structure. What are you trying to get out of it? What is the goal? Are you trying to get a huge long list of things to change? Are you trying to get no list of things to change? Are you trying to get um, you know, a big therapeutic discussion with no action items at the end? What are you trying to get? And then we want to pick the structure that specifically facilitates this. For me, I want retrospectives to create change, right? And so um, when I'm doing the other format where I'm going around the circle asking the three questions, that's not what I end up with. I don't end up with effective change. I, I end up with some of this other stuff. This ties directly into why I think a lot of retrospectives struggle with attendance is because at the end of your retrospectives, you haven't done something with impact. People's lives are not getting better. If, if people's lives get better, they will attend your retrospective. If they see a close connection between your retrospective and their personal happiness, they're gonna come, right? I mean, think about, think about like the most boring meeting you have at work. I, I mean, some of you might be thinking about this presentation, that's fine, but, but think about like the most boring thing that you have to attend at work and somebody says, I tell you what, if you show up, I'll give you a thousand dollars, right? I'll, I'll put it in one of those bags, has the dollar sign on the, on the side. It'd be awesome. We're just handing out free cash at, you know, this week's sales report or something like that. Would you not go? I mean, you would go, right? Because there's immediate value in that. And it doesn't matter how boring it is. It doesn't matter how dry it is. It doesn't matter how repetitive it is. It doesn't matter like say for this like how good looking the presenter is right like none of that stuff matters um you're getting value out of the meeting you're gonna go right you're gonna go get your thousand bucks it's the same thing here uh now if you can pay people a thousand bucks to come to your retrospectives i mean have at it but what i'm suggesting is is that if your retrospectives have very uh palpable value, like very, very perceptible value, people will come. And I think the largest reason for like low participation, low attendance, sporadic participation in retrospectives, the biggest reason for that is not that the retrospectives are boring. Uh, it's not that it has the same format. It's because people aren't seeing the value, like they don't understand what they're getting out of this. And a lot of times the structures that we have chosen have set us up to not deliver that value, right? So I would like, I like people to come to my retrospectives because they see a very, very close connection between their attendance and participation and their quality of life. That connection is crystal clear. And that's why I built the structure that I did. We'll get into that near the end. But whether you use a structure like I do or not, it's really kind of irrelevant. You need to decide for yourself. Like, this is the value I want to deliver. How am I going to get it to these people? Or how are we going to deliver it to each other? Really is probably the, the bigger question. But the thing you got to know is people are not going to spend time doing things if they don't see the value in it. it it's not going to work to say Scrum makes us do it to so show up, right? That, that's not going to win 
the hearts and minds of most of your dev team, right? Or, hey, we're agile now, and this is something agile people do, right? So we got to do the retrospective. The, that agile coach we came in that we paid thousands of dollars to says we got to start doing retrospectives. So let's all do it. And, you know, maybe if we do it enough times, we'll figure out what this is supposed to accomplish. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, just just please, for the sake of the children, just stop doing that. People are people are not going to come to these things unless they understand what the value is. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the state that retrospectives tend to start out in. When we start out in our careers, um, we we tend to like do those kind of traditional three questions, and we end up with wherever that gets us. Well, then some creative people decided that, you know, what will fix this problem of people not attending, people not being engaged, not getting value out of the retrospectives, let's do themed retrospectives. And if you have not experienced a themed retrospective before, you are in for a treat. So the idea behind a themed retrospective is the scrum master or whoever's facilitating whatever pick some kind of theme, usually it's something in pop culture, like Marvel movies or Game of Thrones. Uh, I even saw somebody put together a template for a Squid Games themed retrospective. Uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, I am not coming to a Squid, Ga Squid Games themed anything. That sounds like horrific, right? Like what, what do you do in a, Squid, in a Squid Games themed retrospective? I have a feeling I don't want to experience it. But, but you pick some theme and then everything in the retrospective happens around that theme, right? So, so maybe, maybe we have like a Star Wars theme. And so we ask questions like, where do we need to use the force in our, uh, you know, in, in, in our company? Or, you know, you have like a Game of Thrones themed retrospective and you're like, what, what relatives, what close relatives need to get married on? I mean, you know what I mean? You know, yeah, the, 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 the questions all, all sort of, come from kind of the theme and it sort of keeps things spicy right it keeps things interesting um you know maybe you have like an 80s rock theme and so you know you're playing 80s songs and you know you're you're asking questions like why did our team run so far we ran so far away you know and 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 you you start asking things like that that's a themed retrospective and the idea was that the the reason people are not coming and participating to retrospectives that they're boring, right? Like we keep asking these questions, these same three questions, uh, and, and, we're, and we're bored, right? And so kind of like, you know, you're married for a few years and somebody suggests, hey, how about we dress up like superheroes tonight, right? So it's, it's kind of that same idea, except, except in a work appropriate format. And um, there are people who have really made very large reputations out of producing themed retrospectives. Uh, Chris Stone uh, is a is a UK Agile coach. He's someone I've had on my podcast. Uh, really, really great guy. He has almost 200 themed retrospective templates. Uh, and if you find him on LinkedIn, uh, he's got a link there for him. I don't have that link uh, off the top of my head, but it's a good guy, cool themes. But here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with a themed retrospective, okay? You don't, you don't have to like dedicate yourself to having boring retrospectives. Like you can make it entertaining, right? You can use themes if you want. You can, you can use, you know, music and, and creative thought provoking prompts and things like that. Uh, I mean, that, that's fine. That's great. That's terrific. But if you were having trouble with people being engaged and attending your retrospectives in the first place, it's probably not because you didn't have enough Marvel superheroes in it, right? It's, it's, it's probably not because um, it, it wasn't entertaining enough or gamified enough or, or pop cultured up enough. That's, that's probably not the issue people had with it. And, and, and what we wanna do is we don't wanna use themed retrospectives as like a placebo, right? Like people are bored, people aren't getting anything out of the retrospectives. Oh, I know. Um, you know, let's uh, let's have a, a, a 90s sitcom themed retrospective. That'll turn this ship around. No, it won't. Um, I mean, that might be fun, right? And 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 it might be interesting. And have at it. I mean, please, by all means, do fun stuff with your teams. Please don't don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying try to make everything as as boring as possible. 
But what I am saying is that probably isn't fixing your core issue. Okay, if, if your retrospectives didn't seem to create value for the team, they're not going to all of a sudden just because you, you bring in the squid games, right? So um, people don't actually need the retrospectives to be entertaining. They need them to be valuable, right? That's, that's what they need first and foremost. And then if you want to spice it up, spice it up. Sure, go for it, okay? But, but Star Wars is not, is not going to fix struggling retrospectives. Um, I, for some reason, I wanted to make a joke about where the Star Wars franchise has gone, but I, but because I have unconditional love for all the attendees here, I am going to restrain myself, and um, you know may, maybe at the end if we have time. So, in, in order to kind of put all my cards on the table, so you know where I'm coming from, here's my goal for retrospectives, and 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 your goal may not be the same. It, there may be some slight deviation. There may be a huge deviation, but the format is going to make more sense when you understand my goal. My goal for retrospectives is to inspect the way we're currently working and then adapt it in light of what we're observing. Um, I don't think this is a particularly controversial goal, right? I, I, I would think that most retrospective goals are probably in this neighborhood, um, but this, this is what I want to do with, with the event. I want the team to have walked away having inspected how we're working together and then adapting it in light of what we've observed. Okay. If you're scrum folks, you know, insert all the things about like sprint goals, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm trying for this not to be a scrum specific thing. So here's what I wanted out of my retrospectives. I wanted a framework where it was the team versus the team's problems instead of individuals airing their grievances or <laughs> or individuals against the rest of the individuals, which it sometimes turned into, right? De depending on, uh, depending on, on what we were talking about. I wanted everybody to be on the same boat. I wanted everyone to be in the team, looking out at these objective realities for the team to deal with, as opposed to each individual tackling this. I wanted to come up with one change per event. Okay, and we'll get into why that is in a minute. And again, you may think differently than I do on that. That's 100% fine, but, but um, we'll, we'll get to why I picked that in a minute. But I wanted one change, or if the change is really small, maybe one more, maybe possibly two more if they're really, really small. And I also wanted a way to know if our changes were actually helping or not. <clears throat> and this is the thing. I find that, that Agile mentors, scrum masters, coaches, etc. We we can be really bad about this bit. As long as people feel like things are improving, then we count that as actually improving. Um, and, and it is good when people feel like things are improving. Like I, I do like that, but a lot of times we just kind of stop there. Everybody feeling more productive, everybody, you know, everybody think we're we're getting more value out the door. Everybody, you know, kind of kind of think this is helping and those are good right like we always want people's attitude checks we want that temperature check to make sure that uh everybody's on board and everyone's feeling good about what we're doing but i wanted a way to know right i wanted a way to know for sure if the things that we were doing were actually helping above and beyond just kind of a general feeling of, of well-being about what we were doing so I'm going to introduce you to the Phil Ledgerwood official retrospective format um, with the highly, highly marketable name of Plorf. So I'm going to Plorf you for a few minutes. And again, I'm not advocating that you take what I do and then just drop it like a carbon copy on top of your retrospectives and expect magic to happen. That's kind of what might have gotten you here in the first place, right? Um, but by unpacking what I do, you may see that you may choose to adopt it wholesale. Like you may think, you may find throughout this presentation, like I think exactly like no, no, no worries. And, I'm, I'm and definitely I want my retrospectives Hi, to, to do exactly what he wants to accomplish. Like we are totally aligned. Okay, so you might take exactly what I do and do that. That's fine. But what I really want you to do is understand how my goals have resulted in a structure so that you can do that yourself. You can figure out what you want your outcomes to be 
and then design your retrospective structure to get you to the outcomes that are important to you. I've already told you what outcomes are important to me, and here's the structure that I use to get there. Do I do this with every single team I coach or that I work with? No, I do not. Okay, It doesn't fit every single context. It doesn't fit every single team. Every team, every context is different, right? But I do it with a lot of teams, uh, and I've done it for years and years, and it works uh, pretty awesome, uh, probably because it is sheer genius. So the, the event happens in three phases. Phase one is a celebration of metrics. And what we do is we look at the team's metrics together and we tell stories about what we see. Um, there's a few charts that I find are helpful during this time. The first two I spend very little time on. The third one I spend a ton of time with. Uh, the cycle time scatter plot, this is where we're looking at like how long it takes us to complete individual items. The throughput run, this is uh, how many items do we complete per day or per span of days. And then finally, the cumulative flow diagram. I spend very little time on these first two because it's really easy for the team to get the idea that these are performance metrics and then to orchestrate their improvements around that. So they'll be like, oh, our, our cycle time tends to run about 13 days. All right, well, that sounds bad. Let's get it down to 11 days. Yeah. Having shorter cycle times is not necessarily an improvement, right? Or, or having, having a fuller throughput run is not necessarily an improvement. I don't like for my teams to get the idea that the metrics are performance metrics because they are not. Um, you know, but what I do want the team to take away from the metrics is what's our current state of affairs and where are the trends taking us, right? And the metrics can show us these kinds of things. I spend most of my time on the cumulative flow diagram. Now, if you've ever seen a cumulative flow diagram, some of you are thinking that is the most obscure diagram I can possibly think of. And, you know, and it sort of calls to mind like, you know, back in like the early Middle Ages when, you know, like uh, fortune tellers used to like kill goats and throw their bones on the table and then tell you what's going to a lot of people feel that way about cumulative flow diagrams but i uh, but but once you kind of get used to it and once the team gets used to it i have found that teams become very adept in interpreting their own cumulative flow diagrams and that's where the storytelling part comes in because it isn't about saying oh we're really good or oh we're really bad the metrics don't tell us that the metrics just give us insight into our current situation and um and and then the team can tell stories about why the metrics look the way they do i'll give you an example uh one time our cfd showed that we started to have a huge influx of cards coming into development but the rate at which cards were leaving development uh was not matching that so the cumulative flow diagram was starting to swell and we were like Hey, so what's going on here? And, you know, come to find out that like the guy who was doing UI UX, he would just do the UI UX piece of a user story and then pull the next one, do the UI UX piece, pull the next one, do the UI UX piece, pull the next one. So we started to accumulate like this pile of partially done cards because this UI UX guy was just tearing it up. Right. And this provided a great fodder for the retrospective because then we got to talk about as a team. OK, the middle tier is not moving as fast as the front end. So what do we want to do about that? And we brainstormed ideas and it was pretty cool. So I like to review the team's metrics. We also discuss previous experiments that we've done. What are things we decided to do in other retrospectives? And are these things showing up in the metrics? This helps us determine if things are helping or not. Now, not everything is going to have a big impact on the metrics or maybe even a perceptible impact on the metrics. Sometimes we may choose to do something just to improve morale, right? And the numbers aren't necessarily going to change for that. But we at least have that conversation, right? So, you know, we decided to make change X two retrospectives ago. Here's the trend that our metrics are, go are going on. Is this what we wanted to see, right? Is this... Is this what we were expecting, having made these changes? Um, sometimes it can be very surprising to discover what changes you make that don't change your metrics or actually begin to make them worse. Um, that, that can be a very interesting conversation sometimes. And we, we also want to celebrate wins, of course. Uh, that's very important. But, but know what we're doing here by starting the, 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 the event out this way is now the team 
is looking at something objective outside themselves. It's the team looking at their situation. We're not, we're not sitting around talking about the things that grind our gears, right? Or the things that really bother us. We're just stepping on the bathroom scale and seeing how much we weigh, right? We're looking at this and, and, it, and we are now having this sort of common vision of reality and talking about it amongst ourselves, tell, telling stories, giving meaning to it, um, and, and coming to that common vision as a team of where we're at and where the metrics show us that we're going. This provides great fodder for the next two phases. Phase two is we pick where would we get the biggest bang for our buck? And what we do is we brainstorm potential areas of improvement and we pick one. So we're not coming up with, with uh, ideas at this point. We're not coming up with solutions. We're just talking about the different areas that could be improved that we think if we made an improvement would really help out. Right. And so I put some examples on here. Uh, I don't do a lot of PRs with my teams, but I have worked with a lot of teams that do. This is often an issue in those teams, the time it takes between issuing a PR and getting a response. Like if we were able to improve that time, it would make things a lot better. Um, the amount of time we spend, like rehashing our requirements with the product owner, uh, you know, th these are all how many items we got going on at once. We got a lot of things going on at once. That's a problem. You know, so we're trying to find those areas that if we could make an improvement, it would make a big difference to the team. And then we pick one. Usually, like if we're looking at the metrics, we're seeing what our biggest constraint is. Um, and it's pretty obvious to the team what the, um, what the biggest bang for our buck area is, which incidentally is the constraint. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you, can, you can improve a lot of stuff, but if you're not improving the thing that constrains you the most, you're, you're not going to see as much improvement as you want to see, right? And so usually it's pretty obvious to the team where the biggest bang for our buck would come, but not always. I mean, we discuss it together. Um, sometimes on rare occasions, we may have to vote, but usually just in the course of discussion, we come to a consensus or, or if one person's a really big holdout, uh, usually we can be like, okay, can we make that the thing on the next retrospective? And usually they're okay with that. Um, but we, we brainstorm areas we can improve and we pick one, one area. And then this takes us to phase three. What do we want to do about it? And then this is where we brainstorm possible experiments that would make an improvement. And then we pick one. Now, if the thing we pick is really small, or maybe it's just something for one person to do, like, uh, you know, um, I, I, we've had retrospectives before where the thing we picked is, Phil, could you go tell our manager X, Y, Z, or something like that? And if that's the thing we pick, we need to pick something else, right? So sometimes we might pick two, occasionally, rarely we might pick three, but, but generally we wanna pick one. And there's a number of reasons for this. One is that if we change too many things at once, we're not going to necessarily know what things are helping and what things aren't. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a programmer like me, you've probably had the experience where you have a bug and you change five things that you think could be producing the bug and the bug goes away. But now you don't know what you did to fix it, right? And you don't know uh, which one of those things that I add in that's not necessary. Right. Or or is there some kind of weird like house MD phenomenon where it's the synergy of two or three things that I did, you know, that fixed. The, there's no way to know. There's no way to know what you did that actually fixed the bug when you change too many things at once. Well, it's the same thing with retrospectives. If we change eight things at once and our metrics improve, we don't really know what did it. Right. There may be one of those things that's actually holding us back, but we outsold our problems. Right. So so one thing, it's easier to see the impact. But really, the other thing is one thing is easier for people to do, right? Like how many of us have had a retrospectives where we ended up with like eight action items and then we had our next retrospective and maybe two of them got done or, or zero got done, right? Asking a busy team to make eight changes is a lot, right? That's a huge shock to the system and stuff is going to fall by the wayside and stuff is going to be inconsistently done. If you pick one thing, and that's your focus for that time period, it's very likely to get done, right? And you, it's very easy to reason about, it's very easy to talk about on a regular basis. So 
let's say we picked for our area of improvement the time delay between issuing a PR and then having that PR accepted or rejected. So here's some ideas that we might do. We might add more people to the group of approvers. We might reduce the responsibilities of the person who approves PR so that they can focus more time on it. Uh, we can declare that PR responses are the most important thing that that person could possibly be doing. So they always do it first, no matter what. We could set aside the last hour of the workday to review outstanding PRs, to make sure that we don't go more than 24 hours, right? Or we could review all, all outstanding PRs immediately after they stand up. We're just brainstorming experiments to try, right? And then we pick one. And again, if, if what we pick is really small, we might pick two or three. Okay, so look at the metrics, figure out what the lay of the land currently is, right? Generate, uh, um, you want to annotate my content? Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> this guy is an idiot, right? Is that, is that, uh, I, I tell you what, I'm going to decline right now, <laughs> but. Um, and probably with somebody just uh, accidentally uh, clicking on something. <laughs> to, to what you wanted to say, like in the chat or, or in the questions. Um. What was, I, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Um, so we've got the metrics to sort of determine the lay of the land to kind of get the wheels turning, right? The team is objectively looking at their own situation. We're brainstorming what we think would be the biggest area of improvement and picking one. And then we're brainstorming things that we can improve in picking one. And notice, like, during that whole process, there's a lot of benefits that we get out of this structure. First of all, obviously, it has a really cool name. But secondly, it positions the team to focus on a common problem together rather than individuals focusing on the things that individually bother them. When, when we're trying to, to help a team increase their agility, we want them to approach more and more things as a team, right? Not, not as individuals who share a skill set or individuals who sit in the same room or, or on the same Zoom call. We want them to attack things as a team. We want them to own their work as a team. We want them to own the sprint as a team, right? We, we want them to own all their outcomes as a team. Why should the retrospective be any different, right? So I want a structure that has the team dealing with the situation, not individuals giving their own individual takes on the situation. The structure does that. The use of the metrics and the group focus keeps things highly objective, right? The, the, you can't, the numbers don't lie, right? We, we, we can't just sit around talking about the things that irritate us personally. We have this objective picture looking at us, but at the same time, we're not eliminating the ability for people to share, right? People can still talk about what they think is the most important thing. They can still talk about how much these things affect them as individuals, that's fine. We want that feedback. That's, that's how we go about deciding what thing we should do next, right? So we still have room for people to share um, what's going on with them. And as a team who cares about them, we want to know that. But the focus is objective, right? It's, it's not about what's, what's everyone's personal opinion that week uh, on, on what's really going wrong. And now I have, you know, 12 different personal opinions. It keeps it very objectively, very objectively focused. We, we can see from our metrics and our stories what the issues are, right? So let's pick one and let's work on it together. <clears throat> the next bullet is since the team came up with both the area and the experiment, buy-in is largely automatic. If you struggle getting buy-in with your team, that means almost always you are trying to get them to do something that they themselves did not opt to do. But if they're the ones that came up with it, then you, you can skip that step, right? They already have buy-in. It's their idea, right? Like, I don't have to sell them on their idea. <clears throat> you know, when, when they tell me this is what I think would create the biggest impact and this is the best way I think we could solve it, I don't have to sell them on that, right? They, they, they've done it. They've done that work themselves. And then finally, having only one experiment, usually only one experiment, means that it's very likely to get done and it's easy to evaluate the impact. Now, you might have heard that format and you might have thought, yeah, that's just not for me. That format sounds like it was come up with by a robot. I don't, uh, I don't like it. It's not, you know, it's, 
it's it's not what I'm trying to create with my own retrospectives. That's fine. I can't tell you what to create with your own retrospectives. You you have to figure that out. But what I do want to make crystal clear is you can see like from this list, I had an idea of what I wanted out of the retrospective. And then I designed the structure that I thought would best get me those things. And that's what you need to be doing. If, if you think everything that I've done with my retrospective is just whack and uses, this just has no place on your teams, I'm totally cool with that. I am not emotionally invested on, on the retrospective structure you pick. But if nothing else, I want you to go away having seen a concrete example of, here's what we wanted to get out of this meeting. It needed to be valuable or event. Sorry, Scrum folks. This is, this is what I wanted to get out of the event. Um, this is the value, the very palpable value I wanted the team to see. How am I going to get there? Let's design how we're going to get there. That's what I did. And I'm telling you, I do not have a problem with people entertain, uh, coming to my retrospectives. And it is the same every single time. And I almost never wear a costume. Like um, people come to it because they love the activity of tackling a problem together. That's what developers like to do. They love facing a problem as a team and tackling it together and coming up with something that's going to change their lives. And because we consistently do it, their lives consistently change. Their lives get easier. Their work lives get more enjoyable. Um, and because they see it happening consistently with every single retrospective, they want to come. They, they love to come. They'll stop whatever they're doing to come because it delivers that value for them consistently. All right. I see I'm, I'm getting close to time here. Uh, Mark turned his video on, which is the uh, equivalent of these things, of them playing music for uh, Emmy acceptance speeches. So um, real quick, I want to show you the most boring slide. This is my contact information. Um, it's got my name, it's got my email, <clears throat> got my company link. Do find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with you. Uh, if you heard something and you want to chat more about it over email, that would be great. If you're local, I would love to have a beverage of your choice with you and talk with you about this stuff. Also, uh, again, the link to the Agile Bytes podcast. Uh, the very first episode is Retrospectives That Work. So if you liked what you heard today and you want kind of a refresher on this, very first podcast episode is about this topic as well. And we said very similar things. So that's what I got for you, Mark. Awesome. Okay. Well, Phil also put together a little competitive quiz so that we can take. And remember, the goal of this isn't to necessarily see who will win, although that's, well, okay, that is part of it, right? Um, but what we're trying to do is just give ourselves ways of interacting with the information so we can remember it. So I'm going to throw this out here. Let me find my mouse in the wrong place. Okay, you can join right there. What thinks I'm at the end of the presentation again? That is not what it should be saying. Okay, let me change this really fast. And it's really determined that I'm at the end of the presentation. Okay. Let me see. Well, maybe we'll just have maybe to Maybe it's go trying to, to tell us something. Um, you, oh, okay. Manage results. Let me get rid of the results. That's the problem. I must have played with it too much. Or somebody else played with it. No? Okay, I'm gonna give it one more try here. Okay, I'm on this slide. Oh, oh I may be giving away stuff here. I don't wanna give away. Okay, I'm on the slide. It is there, it is saved. I'm going to reset the results for the whole presentation. Now I'm going to present. Let's go backwards. Uh Oh, okay. oh let's, let's, let's try that. Okay, and there's the link. Um, you can go to that if you want. Oh, you guys are seeing a quiz. Okay, it's just messing with me then. Oh, you know what? I bet the problem was. I think I, I think I know what the problem was. Okay, so let's skip this. There we go. Okay, we got everybody there. All 62 players of the 200 people that were here a minute ago. Okay, so join if you want to. Let me throw this link in here one more time. And... We'll have to give something away. Uh, I will, I'll tell you what, this is just what I happen to grab. I'll give away a copy of my productivity book. Um, also give you access to Phil's library 
of podcasts. So like the link, we'll put that up at the end so you get access, free access to Phil's library of podcasts. And I will send the winner a copy of my productivity book um, if you would like one. Okay, so for, for fun and glory, right? That's our plan here. 89 players, all right. And remember, answer fast to get more points. <clears throat> what is the main goal of a retrospective? So what did Phil say the main goal of a retrospective was? Was it to have a really good conversation about how things are going, to inspect and adapt the way we're working, to let management know how things are going, or to do scrum right? What is the main goal of a retrospective? Coming up on five seconds. Get your answers locked in. Look like we've got almost everybody in there. Good job. Okay, yes. So if I got that right, Phil, it was to inspect and adapt the way, way we're working. Um, why isn't it to let management know how things are going? Why is that a bad answer? <laughs> that, that is almost never the right answer when it comes to an <laughs> Agile event. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, now that is not to say that management does not need to know how things are going. It's just there are certainly much better ways to get them that information than having them to attend your retrospectives. I also discover that depending, and this varies widely, okay, it, it's all about your team's dynamics with management. But I find that there are teams where if management is there, they're just not going to talk. They're, they're not going to tell you. They don't want to talk about their weaknesses in front of the people who can fire them. And uh, so that's that's something you got to figure out for yourself. OK, cool. OK, let's see our leaderboard. Who who took the top spot this time around? It looks like it is Tweeto, followed by Brandon, Sean, Cake, Mo, Tizzy, Osney, Wolfmeister, Betsy and Drawns. Very good. OK, next Question two of six. Oh, we got 90 people are showing up. More people, 92. This may be the biggest one of these we've ever done. So answer fast to get more points. What is a likely reason people may choose not to have or attend a retrospective? Is it because they don't see enough value in it for them? There are not enough pop culture references, Squid Games. The format isn't new every single time. Or they aren't entertaining like all of our other meetings. So yes, the answer was they don't see enough value in them. Uh, let's see who where our leaderboard is here. I like how Phil pointed out that he he almost doesn't ever go in costume, which leaves some room <laughs> for going in costume, right? Um, okay, we've got it, it has it has happened. Has I'll happened. Just, I'll okay. just say that. I'll just leave that there. That that has happened. <laughs> Cake, followed by Betsy, Brandon, Sean, Amy G, Tizzy, Drons, Mo, Puffy, and John. I didn't even figure out how to pronounce your last name. Boris. I think that's how you say it. Question three of seven. Start the quiz. Answer fast to get more points. And how can you increase the value of a retrospective for the participants? Start off with a round of Game of Thrones trivia. Make sure that you have gone around the room so everyone speaks. Identify an idea that will improve the team's lives work-wise. Keep track of everyone's ideas in an improvement backlog. How can you increase the value of retrospective for the participants? So we've got identify an idea that will improve the team's lives work-wise. Um, why, why is 12 not, uh, I'm sorry, why is the last one keeping track of everyone's idea and improvement backlog? Okay. Well, actually, a couple of things about this. So first of all, sometimes I do still go around the circle, especially if you've got a team where people do not feel comfortable speaking, or maybe you've got like one or two very dominant people. For a brief season, I will sometimes do the go around the circle thing. I won't ask those three questions, but I will kind of like put every individual on the spot just for the team to get into the habit of sharing. And then once we've done it two or three times, then I quit. Um, so uh, so I, I'm not saying it's, it's always evil to go around the circle. Um, the, but why isn't it keep everyone's ideas in an improvement backlog? So just because, and I'm not saying improvement backlogs themselves are inherently evil, although it may mean that you're trying to do too much, um, but adding ideas to a backlog does not increase the value. Um, that is not valuable for your team. Your team does not care how big your improvement backlog is. Your, your team only cares about stuff you're actually doing. Uh, they only, their, their self-interest is, is my life getting better or not? And having an item in the backlog does not do it. It's like, do your customers care about the stuff that's in your product backlog? They do not, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, they care about the software that's coming out the door, right? So, 
Okay, so so if if you've got teams, so some of it, it's not that you shouldn't do any of these things, but if you're having trouble getting value out of a retrospective, you want to identify an idea that improves the team's lives work wise. That's going to give you your biggest bang for your buck to start yes. getting value. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Okay, leaderboard. Who's in our top spot this time? Tizzy pulls into the top spot, followed by Betsy, Brandon, Eamon, G, and et cetera. Good job. Okay, question four of six. Asked, gets more points. What do you want to have at the end of a retrospective? What do you want to have at the end of a retrospective? Donuts or ice cream or something, because otherwise no one will show up. I haven't had lunch yet, so that's sounding appealing to me. But an actionable experiment for the team to do, a list of requests for management, or a task list for the Scrum Master. Yes, an actionable experiment for the team to do. Um, I, I, I like the donuts and ice cream one, but I think the other... I, so I, I, There's nothing wrong with that. And, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have a task, something for the Scrum Master to do. That could be actionable, right? But, but the goal is to have an actionable experiment that you can That's measure. That's right. I mean, I have worked with clients before, and when I sat in on their first retrospective, what they ended up with was basically a spreadsheet of stuff for the Scrum Master to do. Mm. And I'm like, well, uh, okay. I mean, <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that's, not a very, that's not a very empowering or life-changing experience, right? And, and there's only so much a Scrum Master can actually do. You know, and so it's like, that's why I like the, the team being in the boat together. Like, what about our lives can we control? Let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, let's come up with this, this initiative and let's do it. Let's not like pawn off on the scrum master, all our troubles and expect them to fix everything. And those of you in the audience who are scrum masters, I'm sure you've been put in a position like that before where it's like, you know, all our team's issues are your job to fix. And you're like, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have time to to get my four year psychology degree, you know, I can't, I can't fix all this stuff. So yeah. Very good. I, I think it could also indicate too, if, if people are just waiting to the retro to ask the scrum master, cause they need help with something, those conversations probably should happen before. That's right. Well, you never have to wait for the retrospective to improve things or to fix right. things. You, you never need to wait for that. Okay, leaderboard. Tizzy still retains the top spot, followed by Betsy, Amy, G, Mike, Monique, Thomas, Sean, Ozzy, Sohill, and Brandon. Question five. Okay, we've got two questions left, so we're down to the wire here. And what are some potential problems to avoid in retrospective? So what are some problems we want to avoid in retrospectives? Uh, nothing actionable at the end to do, or nothing actionable for the team to do at the end. Too many changes effectively to perform and measure. Effect, efficiency gains are so immense that the team's workload gets doubled or both the first answer and the second answer. So yes, the first answer and the second answer, and I, that was a little bit tricky, right? Because you, you, you're trying to go fast, so you click on the first one that you think is right, but there, yes, it was it was both of them. Um, efficiency gains are so immense that the team's workload gets gets doubled. Uh, that's, if, that that's be a, your, if that's your problem, you are killing it. Yes. Like, this is not a problem. <laughs> You might decide to leave leave the organization, but you are killing it if that's what happens. <laughs> okay. Where do we have? Mike pulls into the top space. Very good, Mike. Okay, last question. Get your fingers ready. Um, this was, I we mentioned this a few times and I put it out there a few times. So the question is, Dun, dun, dun. what is the name of Phil's podcast? And there, there's the logo right there. So what's the name of Phil's podcast? So Agile Bits, Agile Eating, Agile Bites, Eating with Agility, or Agile Bites with a Y. What is the name of Phil's podcast? Man, some of these names are really good. <laughs> You're going to spawn off some other series, right? Yes, so it is. The, and the Agile Bits really looks like it, doesn't it? But it's Agile Bites is the name of his podcast. So if you search for that, you will find his podcast. In, it's in the top spot, at least for me, when I searched on, on Google. And... Um, I'll put up a slide with a link to it. So if you leave this up, you can click on it in just a minute. And then we'll check the Q&A here in just a second. So Mike, you took the top spot. Very good. Congratulations. You, uh, you were the fastest clicker who had knowledge of what Phil said today. So very good. Um, or the computer, it's a little bit random sometimes depending on your connection. So Mike, if you send me an email, send me a screenshot and your address, I will send you a copy of my book. And like I said, you have 
full access for life to Phil's library of Agile Bytes. So uh, definitely check check that out. And I bet, I I bet what, he'll make Mark, that available I'll to everyone. I will give Mike free lifetime access to any of my opinions about anything. Anytime he wants, just <laughs> let me know. Wow, Definitely. Mike, that you you got quite a quite a deal there. Okay, so um, here is the link again to the podcast. I encourage you to click on that, download to the podcasting software of your choice. And let me see here. I think we had, I know we had, Tizzy had at least one question here. So let me see. No questions for the audience. Okay, well, I messed something up evidently, but I remember there was a question somebody was asking about how much time you dedicate to the first phase usually. Like how long is a retrospective and how much time do you usually put into the first phase? Yeah, so it's so it's always a little different, right? Because team sizes are different. You know, the frequency with which retrospectives happen uh, can influence that. Uh, I, I usually always start just as a test with an hour for retrospectives and then kind of see what happens. I find that generally speaking, we tend to land about the hour and a half mark in terms of total length of time. But for the metrics piece, um, I really want most of the time to be spent in the brainstorming portions. Um, but at the same time, I want to make sure that the team has a really good idea of where we're at. So I would say that that first phase, that metrics portion, when we're first starting out, I'm doing a lot of education. So it kind of lasts longer, like it might take a whole third or maybe even half. Of, of like that first retrospective, but you don't you don't want to hang out there. Um, eventually, the team like they know what the metrics are. They get used to interpreting them. A lot of us, a lot of times, I'll just pull up the chart and say, "Let's talk about this chart," and the team will just start talking. Um, and you know, when you're starting when you're starting to to move like that, then that first part may only be like about 20 minutes or so. You know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, you know, it, it just kind of depends. So, but, but yeah, you, you don't want that to be the majority of the retrospective. You want the other part to, to definitely be most of your time. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked, what is the metrics you use? Don't address what's bothering. Or I think it's what if the metrics you use don't address what's bothering the team. Yeah. So there's a couple of things for that. So first of all, obviously you have to use metrics that mean something, um, which can be a whole topic unto itself, right? A lot of times we, we do not, uh, we don't always use actual valuable metrics when we're having these discussions. So, um, so that's that's a this is a very valid concern. So first of all, you want to use uh, good metrics. I like to use flow metrics because they speak directly to how work is moving through the team, and they allow us to easily find our constraints and they give us the occasion to start telling stories. Like, why do things batch up here? Why do things move so slowly here? And that's when we usually start getting into the actual issues, right? Metrics don't tell you why, they tell you what, you know? So the team, human beings have to supply the why and they start saying, oh, you know, uh, we just have been getting stuff done so fast, QA is just overloaded. You know, they just, they just can't get stuff tested fast enough. So now we've identified something we can talk about, right? Grist for the mill, right? Um, now, sometimes something may be bothering the team and it doesn't show up on the metrics, maybe like it's a morale issue and it doesn't directly. There's not a number that shows you that. Right. That's fine. We, we're, we're not robots. We can always decide like, hey, you know, this thing may not be a metrical constraint, but obviously we're all terribly bothered by it. So let's just do this thing. You know, that you can always choose to do that and, and you're never going to go wrong, you know, trying to increase people's happiness. Right. Um, but I but but I, I, I don't like the retrospective not having the metrics because I want us to at least know. Right. I want us to at least know what the landscape is. And if we decide that's not what what we really want to focus on right now, that's fine. That's the team's decision. Um, but I at least want them to know. Uh, here's here's what our metrics are looking like. Here's what our constraints and flows are looking like, um, so that if if uh, so that they'll know what to address if that's what we're going to address. I and I like uh, one kind of aha moment for me when you were going through that was just kind of the idea of if we are doing an experiment when we get back together to talk, we ought to start with something that's objective of just what happened last minute. You know, if mm -hmm. we were just really killing it, maybe something went really well. But if we were really, really killing it and got lots of stuff done and everybody hates their lives, that still might not be success that's too, right? But you're right. at least starting with something, mm -hmm. what happened last time? Yeah, um, yeah that's exactly right. Uh, team has problems coming from outside the team. 
benefits from retro seem trivial in comparison? How do you sell the benefits in that kind of environment? Yeah, so that's that's certainly tricky because certainly teams can only control what they can control, right? Um, it's, it's very hard for the team to adopt an experiment that actually involves someone else changing. And, and so typically <clears throat> that's where that's where the mechanism of the retrospective may not be the best way to address that issue, right? And that's where we really, that's where we do kind of need to start leaning on our scrum masters or our team leads or our managers um, to, to kind of be able to have that kind of meta level, um, you know, addressing the structural issues that our team has to work in that are causing us to suffer. Having said that, that doesn't mean a our team can't influence those structures. Sometimes the team has a lot more power than they think. And if there's a constraint the team has to work under that they don't like but don't directly control, that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily have influence and they can't go to that person or group or whatever and say, hey, we really want things to change this way. Can you partner with us? Can you help us? Can we get this done? Life will be a lot better for us. Um, the other thing too is depending on your organization, retrospectives or some kind of mechanism like them can happen at any level of abstraction. It doesn't have to be like a single scrum team or a single developer team. It can be a cross-sectional team across many different departments or, um, or many different groups. Uh, you can arrange these self-reflective, um, let's analyze the way we work together events for almost any level of the organization you can imagine. And a lot of times those are great places to surface those uh, interdepartmental kinds of issues. Um, do you have just a few minutes, Phil? I know we're a little past the oh, hour, yeah. but we've got some people no. still around. Okay. I'm good. Um, so next question here, if we're only running one improvement experiment per retrospective, assuming half of them work, is that enough improvement? Yes. Um, so, so, here, so here's the thing. Uh, so first of all, um, like I said before, if something needs to be fixed, you don't need to wait to the retrospective to fix it. Um, you know, so so you your team should be making various fixes and improvements as you go. All the retrospective does is it gives us a very focused time to to really as a group deliberate, discuss and focus on a particular improvement, but you really should be continuously improving, um, you know, in, in small ways or, 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 or even sometimes in big ways throughout, right? Um, but the, the other thing is that, it, and I'm speaking from my experience and it may not match your experience. So, so you, you, may you may have experienced something very different than this, that's fine. We're all shaped by what we've experienced. And, and my experience has been that if, if you come away with your retrospectives with a list longer than, say, three items, then the odds are pretty good that those items are not going to get done, or they're only going to get halfway done, or they're going to happen inconsistently, um, and they, they don't take root, and you never really know if they helped or not. And I would rather have one thing that I know for sure is getting done that we can absolutely figure out if it's helping or not, then have like five to eight things that we sort of kind of did, but then they kind of fizzled out or we did them all, but we're not really sure if they helped or, or not or, or whatever. So I, I am a big fan of the pick one thing. Um, if, if that's, but you, you do you, right? Like if your team's like, Hey, we need to improve more than this, you know, pick two things. And if that works great, um, or you can have retrospectives more frequently. Um, that's, a, that's another way to deal with that issue as well. But it sounds like the, the concern you're bringing up is the more things you add, the less focus each of them have, like you're splitting your focus. And it's, so it's the whole if, whip, if you, it's the whole right. thing, right? Okay. Like, like if you, if you've got five things that are halfway done, that's not as valuable as one thing that's all the way done. Right. And um, yeah. And yeah, when you have multiple things and you're like, okay, this sprint, let's make these eight changes. That's a lot. That's a lot to ask people to do, right? Now, two things, eh, it's not so bad, right? But, but you know, you, you end up hitting that point pretty quickly. At, at least that's been my experience with teams. Cool. Okay. Um, so, yes, there is a recording. I put a link there. I will follow up with anyone that joined this, give you a, a link to it. Um, 
And Phil, if, if you want to share the slides, if there is a way to do that, send them to me and I'll get them included in that as well. Oh, yeah. People were asking about that. A couple of people asked. I mean, I spent a lot of time on them. I don't know. That's, I, I mean, that, that theme you used was pretty impressive. Yeah, I, yeah. I was like, there was a lot yeah. there. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hey, Phil, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks for staying a little bit longer to answer oh. some of the questions. And um, I learned quite a bit. I'm sure everybody else did too. Uh, and just let people know what's coming up. I need to get some other things scheduled. But next week, what is behavior-driven development? If you have people on your team, they're like, hey, we'd like to find out a little bit more what that looks like. This is a great thing to invite them to. Just take the invite. You can send them to this, the events.zeric.net, or just forward the invite that you've got onto them. Um, that's a great way to give them, get, let people kind of see what it's, what it's about. And don't forget the important thing right here. Oh, can I go back to it? I can't. Okay, it's Agile Bytes, right? Um, I will mm -hmm. throw it in the chat one more time, and it will be in the email I send out. But check, check out Phil's podcast. It's great. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you next week. Thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you.